Every day, the world fills our screens with news, often negative. But what if we dared to change that narrative? What if we chose to focus on the positive? Picture a world where good news shines brighter because, as it said, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. We're all following something. The world may offer bad news, but Jesus, he brings nothing but good news. There is good news for people who like good news. It is good to have you here today, those of you in the room. So glad that you joined us today. Those of you online, thank you for joining us from wherever you're coming from, and uh, glad that you are worshiping with us today uh, as we continue in on our summer series about the good news, looking specifically at the book of Galatians, uh, this letter that was written to these churches in what is today known as, as Turkey. I, I've mentioned over the years that I was raised in a church of, of fairly traditional church, so grateful for my heritage, for my upbringing, for the foundation that I had as, as a child. But in the church that I was raised in when I was a kid, and even into my high school days, it seemed that when we were in church, I, don't, I can't remember about outside of the walls of church, but when we were at the church building, that the, the preferred uh, prefix, the honorific title that we would use was not Mr. and Mrs. and Miss or doctor or any of that, it was brother and sister. That's how we would refer to it, people. And we'd, for instance, someone would get up and say, before Brother Marvel, that was my dad. I couldn't really call him Brother Marvel because he's my dad. But before Brother Marvel comes to share the message with us, we're going to have uh, Sister Pearsall and Sister Stallnacker. We'll do the offertory on the piano and the organ. Uh, Brother Logan, would you come and bring the ushers and, and bless our tithes and offerings? It's this brother and sister. Now, we weren't Amish, but it kind of sounded like we were calling each other brother and sister. The whole idea was that we were part of a family. That we were not just going to church together, but we were, we were in this together as a family. And in those days, this was again in the 70s, early in the 70s, there was this powerhouse couple named Bill and Gloria Gaither that wrote this song that kind of became the anthem for this idea that we are a family. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood. Joint heirs with Jesus as we traveled this sod. Had no idea what that meant when I was a kid. But I'm part of the family, the family of God. It was this idea that we are together as a family. Now, the first verse of that song that they wrote goes this way. You will notice we say brother and sister around here. Now, they weren't from our church, but they knew what we were doing. It says, it's because we're a family and these folks are so near. When one has a heartache, we all shed a tear and rejoice in each victory in the family so dear. This idea that we are as a family, we are there and we are burdening, shouldering each other's burdens. We are weeping with those who weep, rejoicing with those who rejoice, and together as a family. And I would say this is a part of how we not only as a church should operate, but as human beings, we need that idea of community. And with that little, little teaser on this one, this fall... We're going to make an, an absolute concerted effort to invite hundreds of you to connect in a Christ-centered community if you're not already, primarily through a small group, to try this for a season because it's more than just showing up for an hour for a church service once a week. It's being there for each other. It's, it's iron sharpening it's iron. It's encouraging one another, helping one another along, praying for one another, and we want to see that happen for us. So we, we were in this idea of, of a family. So we call each other brother and sister. But it wasn't new to us. We weren't the ones that made this up, and it wasn't even something that the Gaithers did or that was part of the 70s. Because if you recall, when Jesus' disciples asked him and said, Lord, teach us to pray, he said, this is how you ought to address God, our Father. It's a family. When Paul would write to the church in Ephesus, he said, for this reason, I kneel before the Father from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. It's this idea of the family of God. And that is the issue. That is the topic. That is the focus that we're going to be looking at today as we continue on in our st uh, study of Galatians. We're going to finish out Galatians chapter 3, dip into Galatians chapter 4. So if you have your devices or a Bible, want to follow along, end of Galatians 3, we'll pick up where we left off. Now, as we get into this and see what Paul says to these churches and to these followers of Christ about being a family, I want to make sure that we're clear on a di differentiation. He's not talking about this whole idea of a, of a universal family of humanity. That is true. And there was a time in Acts chapter 17 when he's in Athens and he's speaking to the Athenians about this 
this idol to an unknown God. He's trying to explain to them this God. And he says, as one of your poets says, we are all his offspring. So there is that, that God is our creator, that we are in the family of the human race. And the truth is this, no matter whether you believe in God or not, you are created in the image of God. We are in that universal family. That's not what Paul's talking about here in Galatians 3 and 4. What we see is there's something more relational, more connected, deeper. And what we're going to see is who is a part of this family? How do they become a part of that family? And what are the benefits of being in that family? What what does that mean to us in our status in this family? And this is my prayer for us and for every single one of us in this room and those of you online today as we do this that you will have a greater understanding, an expanded understanding of what it means for you to be in this family, that because of that, you will have a deeper experience and a greater, more fulfillment and joy in enjoying being a part of that family. So, ready? You and I are ready. Okay. So let's pick up where we left off last week. Galatians chapter 3, verse 26. Paul writes these words, you are all, 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 you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Now, immediately, some of you are going to be going, oh, man, well, shouldn't we change that? I mean, when you're talking about sons of God, like he's excluding half the audience. Or if you look at the demographics of the church, more than half the audience. I mean, that seems so exclusive. It seems borderline chauvinistic, maybe even misogynistic. Shouldn't we use more inclusive language? Shouldn't he have said, you're all sons and daughters of God? You're all the children of God? And and, and yes, we can do that. In fact, some of your translations may have that, actually, that we're all children of God. And that is true. But if we take this away from the the, the specific word, you are all sons, we will miss some of the depth and some of the beauty of what he's trying to get at for his audience there. Uh, Let me give you another example. The Bible refers to the church as the bride of Christ. If I said, ah, you know what, wait a second, I don't want to be a bride. That's not, you know, can can we change it to be more inclusive? Could the church be the spouse of Christ? That might be better, because then us guys don't feel so weird about that. You know, that that we could be the significant other of Christ. Uh, We could be the plus one of Christ. You know, the the part, yeah, we could, but in so doing, you miss out on the beauty of the whole metaphor and of what God intended for a husband and wife and how the husband lays down his life for his wife. You miss all of that. It, It could be true. Likewise, here, when he says, you are all sons of God, we could say sons and daughters, we could say children, but we miss out on some depth. One of the things that he's talking about in their setting is that daughters could not inherit property. So when he says, you're all sons, what he's saying is that, and we'll see this in a minute, is that you're all legal heirs in this family. And the way that you get into this family, he says, you're all sons through your faith in Christ Jesus. And hasn't that been his message the whole way? This is the euangelion. This is the good news that he keeps saying. That you don't get into this family by being circumcised. You don't get in this family by observing and keeping and obeying the law. You don't get in this family by being a, your gender, by being a male. No, no, you get into your family by the faith in what Christ has done, not what you have done. And he says, all of you, your, your legal heirs in this family because of your trust in Christ and what he has done. And then he goes on, and again, talking to everybody, he says, verse 27, for all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There's this picture of, of baptism and, and this whole idea of being clothed in Christ. The baptism is this beautiful thing. We love baptism. We love to celebrate baptism, this public display, this external demonstration of an internal reality. I've died to the old self. I've raised the new in Christ. It's a beautiful thing, but it's an event. Clothing, on the other hand, is a daily reality. Every single, you're not baptized every day, but every day you get up and you decide, will I put clothes on? Fortunately, you did. Those of you home, I have no idea, and I don't care. (laughs) You decide every day, will I clothe myself? What will I clothe myself with? How will I be clothed? And he says, you've had this event. You've been redeemed by your faith in Christ. You've been baptized. That's not the end of it. It's not the, 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 that's just the beginning. Now it's this daily clothing yourself with Christ, that you put on these clothes of Christ. 
that it's this old is taken away and everything has become new. So, so we, are, we are immersed and we are clothed and covered with Christ. That we are cleansed and clothed with Christ. Like in Christ now, it's a daily reality that we take that old self off and we put on this new self who's created to be like the image of Jesus Christ. And with that, it's an everyday decision that impacts all of our life. Again, the church that I was growing up in, on Sundays, we wore our Sunday best. You go to church, and I get, I understand the whole mentality that was the respect for God. We're going to the the King of Kings, the Lord of the universe. We're going to give our very best. I get that. But it got to the point where it kind of became like, this is what it really means to be spiritual, is wear your Sunday best. See, like what I'm wearing today, that would not have gone when I was growing up. (laughs) Not a chance. My mom would have disowned me. There's no way that I would have ever been allowed to wear tennis shoes on Sunday morning. Maybe Sunday night, but not Sunday morning. And these jeans have been forbid. I had to explain to my mom that in Israel, the priestly tribe were the Levites. That helped, (laughs) but it took some work. But the whole idea is is that we wear our Sunday best on Sunday. Doesn't matter what you wear the rest of the week. The problem is, when you begin to see yourselves being clothed in Christ, if it's just uh, some facade that we put on to go to church to look good in front of the other followers of Christ, we've missed it completely. It's not a Sunday-only clothing wardrobe that we wear. It's every day we decide, and every day with all of our life, and the things that we think, the things that we say, the things that we act, our, 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 our relationships, our spirituality, our sexuality, our, our finances, our priorities, all of these things... He says, and you are clothed in Christ. You've taken off the old and you've put on the new. In three weeks, I think, when we get into Galatians chapter 5, he'll go into this really intensely in Galatians 5 where he lists off all the acts of the sinful nature, all the old clothes we used to wear, like sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy and drunkenness, orgies, and the like. And then he says, but... The new clothes are the fruit of the Spirit, the love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. Now, we'll get to that. Don't get ahead of yourself like I just did. So we will get to that. But he says, you take the old off, and daily you are clothing yourself with Christ. This is your identity. This is what you choose to do every single day. And I wonder when Paul writes that, if he's thinking about, because he would have been so schooled in Scripture, He would have known the the law and the prophets, all that. If he's thinking about that beautiful passage from the prophet Isaiah, when Isaiah 61, Isaiah says this, I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom adorns his head like a priest and as a bride adorns herself with with her jewels, that that I've been clothed, I've been robed with salvation and righteousness. This this picture of of, of, this has been draped over me. Again, in the church I was raised in, and some of you were raised similarly, singing the hymns. On Christ's solid rock I stand. I I think it's verse 3 or 4. I can't remember. It's been a while. But it says, when he shall come with trumpet sound. Oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. It's this clothed, dressed, clothed in the righteousness of Christ, that he became my sin so that I might become his righteousness. Maybe Paul wasn't thinking about Isaiah at all. Maybe he was thinking about Genesis chapter three, which we looked at briefly last week. When Adam and Eve had fallen to temptation, they had sinned, they entered into this curse, they find themselves naked and they're embarrassed and they're ashamed, and realizing that, they try in their own efforts to cover over their sin and their consequences, trying to sew fig leaves together, and it simply doesn't work. So God, in his goodness and grace, sheds the blood and takes the life of an innocent third party, an animal, and makes skins to cover over their shame and their guilt a foreshadowing of what would happen thousands of years later when the precious blood of our Lord and Savior, the Lamb of God, his life would be taken so that his righteousness could cover over us. He says, listen, all of you, you're sons of God because of your faith in Christ. You've been baptized into, not into a denomination, not into a church, you've been baptized into Christ himself. Now clothe yourselves 
with Christ. And then he makes one of the most countercultural, revolutionary, radical statements in their mind that they could even imagine coming from him. Verse 28. He says, There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor free male. Free male? <laughs> it's something the Postal Service is doing these days. Let me try this again. <laughs> There's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Amen. Now, Paul was a free male Jewish you know, ra- ra- uh, Pharisee. And in his culture, in his world, in his whole surroundings, there would be a lot of advantages that would come to him because of those distinctions. And now, he's kind of pointing out, like, for women in that culture, they weren't given the same status as men. In fact, a woman's testimony would not hold up in a court of law. They were kind of dismissed. They were kind of second class. A slave, a slave, they weren't even seen as human. They didn't have any rights. They could be bought. They could be sold. They could be killed. No consequence. And Greeks, the Gentiles, as far as the Jewish people thought, they were a waste of space and resources on the planet. They should not even exist. And Paul comes along now, and he says, no, wait a second. We're all in this family. We're all one. In this family, there's no advantage or disadvantage with your distinctions. The fact that, that in the past there was like some stuff that was good news for some, but bad news for others. But that's not the case anymore. It used to be good news for the men, bad news for the women. Good news for the free, bad news for the slaves. Good news for the Jews, bad news for the Gentiles. And he says, not anymore. There's no second class citizens in this family. There's no ranking in this family. There's no hierarchy in this family. The ground is absolutely level at the foot of the cross. And the interesting thing about this is that it's not just bad news for some and good news for others. When it's that way, what Paul realizes, it's bad news for all of us. It's bad news even if you're a male and you're free and you're Jewish, because keeping the law and being circumcised, that's not going to cut it for you. That's why there's good news. And it's good news for all of us. It's because we're one not in keeping the law. We're one not in being circumcised. We're one in Christ. Do you notice the common denominator? We're three verses into this one. Four times he's referenced Christ. He starts off saying that you are sons of God because of your faith in Christ. You've been baptized into Christ. You are clothed with Christ And you're all one in Christ. It's the centrality of Christ. That's why the reason we exist, you hear me say it all the time, the reason we exist is to help people find and follow Jesus. Because there is no one or no other thing that's any better than that. It's the centrality of Christ. Can I remind you of what it says in Ephesians 2 about the supremacy of Christ? That that he was the, the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, So all things were created by him and for him, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, they were all created by him and through him. He is before all things and in him, all things hold together. He's the head of the body, the church. He's the beginning and the firstborn from amongst the dead. So then everything, he might have the supremacy for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile all things to himself, the things in heaven or on earth, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Listen to me and hear it again. At Cornwall Church, we are all about one thing, Jesus Christ. Amen. He is the only one to be exalted. He's the only one to be worshiped. He's the only one to be followed. It's Jesus Christ. And Paul says, and you're all one in Christ. Paul, being a Jewish man, would have been raised saying at least two prayers every single day. There was the Shema out of Deuteronomy, Hear, O Israel, the Lord, the Lord your God is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. He would pray that every morning and every night, even from a childhood. But later in life, there is a Jewish prayer that Jewish men prayed every single day. And this is what they would pray. Lord, I thank you that you did not create me a woman, a slave, or a Gentile. 
And when Paul makes this statement in Galatians 3, 20, 28, he's reversing this prayer that he has prayed his entire life. That that is the old way he thought. That was the old way they operated. But in this family, it's the end of the old way and the beginning of a new way. That we're all one. It's all equal here. And so all of us are part of this family. None higher than another. Only Jesus and then us. So he concludes chapter 3 with these words in 29. If you belong to Christ, hold on to that because we'll come back to that whole idea of belonging to Christ. If you belong to Christ... Then you are Abraham's seed. That was last week. If you weren't here last week, you can watch that. We won't go into that whole thing in, in, in Genesis 15. You are Abraham's seed and heirs, that's going to be really important, heirs according to the promise. Remember, slaves and women couldn't be heirs. Gentiles wouldn't be heirs. But now he's saying, you are all heirs to this promise. Okay. For the sake of time, I got to skip some verses. So we're going to go into chapter four. It's all related. You can read it on your own, verses one through three. We're going to jump to verse four, chapter four, verse four in Galatians. And in chapter four, verse four, Paul gives these four little statements about Christ and his coming. This is a verse that I've heard preached in December, usually around Christmas, about all the things that needed to happen for God to send his son. And it's perfect. I've, I've done this. Galatians chapter four, verse four, this is where we'll go. It says this. But when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law. These four statements. Time has fully come. God sent his son, born of a woman, born of the law. And usually what I hear, and it's very common, is that this idea of when Jesus came to the earth, it's because the conditions were perfect. Like the Roman Empire had surrounded the entire Mediterranean area. It's almost like the end of the world as we knew it was, was all unified. That there was this Roman Empire, and not only that, but the Romans had done extensive work in this road system so that there was transportation from area to area, not just town to town, but complete regions that was possible. In addition to that, there was one language that everyone understood, even the common folks, this Koine Greek, that they all spoke this, and, and you could communicate in different regions without these different dialects and different languages. And there was the Pax Romana, the, the peace of Rome and the military. And because of all of these circumstances, it made a perfect situation for God to send his son because not only could Jesus come, the message could be spread throughout the Roman Empire. Absolutely true. But sometimes we get this idea that, well, then God must have been sitting up in heaven saying, just waiting, just waiting to, to, to bring my plan, just waiting for my son. As soon as those guys get this all together and oh, I'm just waiting, just waiting, boom, okay, I'm ready. I can do my plan now. That's not the case. God is sovereign. Amen. God wasn't waiting on man. God had his plan from the beginning. Man's just going along with it. Some of you are Lord of the Ring fans. Some of you are not, and that's okay. Lord of the Ring, in the movie, there's this scene where um, Gandalf, who's a wizard, comes to a party at, at Bilbo's house, Bilbo Baggins. He's a hobbit. And Frodo's there, and Gandalf actually showed up a little later than the party was starting. So Frodo is kind of chiding this wizard, Gandalf, about showing up to the party late. And in the movie, Gandalf says this, a wizard is never late, nor is he early. He arrives precisely when he means to. And God wasn't waiting around for humans. God sent his son precisely when he meant to. Not a minute too soon and not a minute too late. And a little side note for those of you who are prophecy and end times freaks. Jesus is coming back. Amen. And he will not come back a minute too soon or a minute too late. And you can figure out all your charts and all your prophecies to know exactly when that is and you're wrong. <laughs> the end of my prophecy seminar. It says it was in the fullness of time, right when God had prepared it, precisely when. And then it says, God sent his son. Now, those of us raised on John 3, 16, we know, of course he sent his son. But this is very important that, that Jesus wasn't just another prophet. He wasn't just another human being. This was God's son. What does John 1 say? In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. 
Hebrews chapter one talks about Jesus being the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being, that, that Jesus was fully God, divine, completely, that all the fullness of the deity dwells in bodily form, it says in Colossians two. But he's not just the son of God, he was born of a woman. We looked at this last week, Genesis chapter three, talks about the seed of the woman that will crush your head, that, that whole thing, or the prophecy that, that he was fully human. Isaiah seven says, this will be a sign to you, the virgin, the virgin, the woman will be with child. That he was fully God and he was fully human and he was born under law, like he doesn't get a pass. He comes to identify as one of us. He, he comes into our world just like everyone else does under the law. So here's this, in the perfect time, God sends his son who's born of a woman under law. And Jesus is the only one that ever could or ever did fulfill the law perfectly, ever. No one else did. So you might be going, okay, well, it makes sense of when this happened and who it was and how it happened and what was going on, but why? Why would, why would Paul write this and why would God do this send Jesus under the law? Was it to show us that actually if you tried hard enough, you actually could live according to the law? Was it that he came as a coach and a motivational speaker to say, you know what, you can do this and I'll show you how because I did? No, it's the exact opposite. When the time was right, when in the fullness of time, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law for this purpose, to redeem those under the law. The very reason was not to show us how we can keep the law, it's to redeem us because we're under the law. Listen, here's the truth that we can all sing. I fought the law and the? The law won. The law always wins. You don't win when you fight the law. We can't keep the law. We're under the burden of the law. We're under the curse of the law. We're under the condemnation of the law. He came to redeem us out from underneath that. This word redeem was, was, a, 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 it was a, a financial word, world, word used in the world of slave trade and, and selling. One of the commentaries I read said it was estimated that during the first century in the Roman Empire, there could have been up to 60 million slaves. And when you went to the slave market to redeem a slave, you would pay the price in full and you could redeem it for one of two purposes. To own it, the slave, to own him or her, to own this slave or redeem them to set them free. Jesus came paid the full price to redeem us. If you remember, we just looked at chapter 3, verse 29. If you belong to Christ. Is it 1 Corinthians 7 that says, you are not your own, you were bought at a price. But he also comes to set us free. To free from the law, free from the curse, free from the condemnation, free from the burden that we are owned and we are set free because of what Christ has done for us. See, the son was sent into our world to redeem. It's a legal status. It's a legal status that we have this freedom now. About eight years ago, I was in South Africa uh, for a race. We had some time for, for a, um, a sightseeing. And one of the things we did was we went uh, on a trip out to Robben Island uh, off of Cape Town where uh, Nelson Mandela and many, many others were imprisoned during apartheid. And so we took the boat out to, to Robben Island and we got off the boat and they assigned a guide to us, uh, an older gentleman who's uh, South African. And um, so he's showing us around the island and all the places, you know, the lime uh, quarry where, where Mandela's eyes were ruined because of the, the bright sun reflecting off of these white rocks for years with no protection and showed us these areas where different things and all the things that got on. Then we went into a cell block and this man was showing us this little cell and how small it was and the bed and how you know, rudimentary and had just how little they had and, and how many hours a day they had to stay in that cell and how often they would be let out and what they would do when they were let out. He's given us all this information. And then he stopped and he pointed to this little cell and he said, this is where I was imprisoned for many, many years. At that point, he's not just giving us information that he's learned. He's talking about something that he's experienced. And the last thing he would ever want is to spend one more day in that cell, and he wouldn't want that for anybody else. So when Paul comes along, he understood, he was an expert in the law, 
but he had spent his whole life imprisoned under the law. And he says, I don't want to spend one more day in that law. And I don't want that for any of you. That's why he would say to these churches in Galatia, don't listen to these guys that say you have to follow the law to be right with God. Don't listen to them. Say you have to be circumcised to be in the family. Don't listen to them at all. Cause I don't want you in the cell of the law. You're free from the law. You're free in Christ. And that alone is incredibly good news. What's the Greek word again? You and Gillian. Gillian. Super good news, but that's not where it stops. He continues on. He says, we've been uh, to redeem those under law that we might receive, this verse uh, five, that we might receive the full rights of sons. Again, using very specifically that word sons, and we've talked about why. The full rights of sons. Now, there's a um, kind of a derogatory term. I don't know if it's politically correct, but it's, it's a derogatory term that is used not just with people, but it can be used with inanimate objects as well. The derogatory term is um, redheaded stepchild. Um, that term basically means um, neglected, uh, unwanted, um, overlooked. I mean, you could say, yeah, that corner of our yard, that's our red, red-headed stepchild. It's like, you know, we don't, we don't weed, though. We don't fertilize. We don't water. It's just like we, we just neglect that. I mean, it could be very derogatory for a person, but you can use it for other things. Well, Twelve years ago, uh, my mom, um, who was a widow at the time, got remarried to a man, wonderful man named Larry. And on the day that they got married, I realized I just became a red-headed stepchild. <laughs> I resemble that remark. Now, now, let me just say, Larry, if you're watching... Larry's an incredible man, so good to my mom. He's been gracious to me, been generous to me. But the reality is, I'm a redheaded stepchild. Uh, he, he loves me. He's, he's good to me. And there will come, he's got four sons. He doesn't need any more. And there will come a day when, when he will die and his sons will get an inheritance. And, and I don't expect anything from him. I'm not one of his sons. As good as he is and as good as he treats me, I'm still nothing more than a redheaded stepchild. Well, grayer and balder, but you get the point. Paul says here, we've received full rights as sons. There's no redheaded stepchild in the family of God. They don't exist. Because when you're in this family, you have the full rights of sons. I like how the, the English Standard Version translates it this way. To rede- redeem those under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. Okay, that changes things a little bit. And what's interesting is what comes to our mind when we think about adoption, and it's a beautiful thing. But what comes to our mind when we think adoption is different than what his readers would have thought of when they heard the word adoption as sons. Uh, there's a, a, a scholar named uh, Nijay, uh, Nijay Gupta, and this is what he wrote about adoption in the Roman Empire in the first century. He writes, women could not and were not adopted, at least not legally. Also, unlike modern adoption, a person was placed as a son, typically as an adult, not as a child. The goal was not to care for a poor orphan, but to bring a male into the family to serve as heir and inheritor in view of the father's death. In their understanding, adoption wasn't about, oh, this little child, his parents died, or they can't take care of him, or they don't have, you know, whatever. That wasn't it. Adoption was an adult, and it wasn't to care for a poor orphan. It was to bring this person in as an adult. And it's amazing, you can do your research on this, how many Roman empires were adopted so that they then became emperors. You've heard of Julius Caesar. He did not have a son. He didn't have an heir. So he adopted a man, a man, not a boy, a man named Augustus. And Augustus, by being adopted then became the emperor of the Roman Empire. Augustus adopted Tiberius. Tiberius adopted Caligula. Caligula adopted 
Claudius, you see how this goes? And every time they're adopted, it's not as little children. It's as grown adults for, this, the, for the purpose of being the heir and the emperor. So Gupta goes on, he says this. They were not adopted because they were poor, orphaned, or mistreated children. On the contrary, they were found to be worthy of entering a prestigious household through adoption, so to become emperor, the highest station in the land. So when Paul says you've been adopted as sons, the thing they come, that comes to their mind, the emperor of the whole Roman empire was adopted for that purpose. They're only important people got adopted. And you, as adopted sons, are not just adopted into an upper class family or a royal family. You were adopted by the sovereign king of kings, lord of lords, creator, eternal one of the universe brought in to be an heir in his family. Well, what an unbelievable picture that comes to their mind with adoption. Oh, okay, I gotta, I gotta keep playing here. So, so we're adopted in, verse six, because you are sons, not so that you can become sons. That's already happened with what Jesus has done. Because of that, because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. Now that word is hard to translate. It's, it's this familial term that children would cry to their dad. A little baby would maybe say, Dada. Abba could be translated as Dada or Daddy or Papa. It's, it's, it's what a child would say to his father. Now, what's interesting here is you see these, these two things that are almost like parallels. God sent his son into the world. Now he sends his spirit into our heart. Uh, Monday morning this week, I got up, shaved, showered, got dressed. I went down to the courthouse, went through the metal detector up to the second floor, superior court, into the chambers of the Honorable Judge Freeman, which is a really cool name for a judge. So anyway, so I'm in the court, and I go sit down, waiting for uh, Judge Freeman to come out of his chambers. And I'm sitting there, waiting quietly. Now, I kind of need to give you the backstory of why I'm even in the courtroom. Some of you have got all kinds of things going through your mind right now. It's not true. Let me give you some backstory. Several years ago, I don't even remember how many years, six, seven years ago, I can't remember. A, a good friend of mine uh, went through a divorce. And a, a horrible thing, he was divorced. And he and his uh, ex-wife uh, had joint custody of their three children. And uh, he had his business. And so he was raising his kids, wanted to have a stable home for his children and, and, uh, and go on with his business. His name's Scott. I asked permission to share this. So he's got this life going, trying to help his kids, you know, and all this, and, and it's going on. So he's going through life, trying to get this new normal for his family. And one of his coworkers said, hey, there's this woman I think you ought to meet. He said, no, no, really, I'm not interested. I just kind of gone through this deal. I've got these children. I want to make a stable home for them. I want to focus on my business. I, I'm not interested. It wasn't me, by the way. I'm not Cupid, okay? So, so no, we, we think you ought to meet this, this guy. She said, uh, really, thanks, but no thanks. Not interested. Don't, don't need to meet her. And they said, well, no, but, but she's, she's young, and, and, and she's a widow, and she has kids about the same age as your kids. She says, I, you know, I, I, don't, I don't want to meet her. I don't know. No, not at all. But she's a young widow with two boys. She, she's busy with two boys of her own. All of them have hair brown, like their mother. And he says, no, no, finally. There's the one day when this lady met this fellow. And they knew that it was much more than a hunch. And all of a sudden, he changed his mind. Maybe I do want to get to know her. And so... Scott and Joy began to date, and Doreen and I were a part of Scott's life, so we were kind of brought into this whole thing, and they would come with their five kids and all this. And, and it was really cute. What, what Joy had her boys, how would they address this man who's not their dad, but, but he's kind of a part of their life? And they landed on these boys. We call him Mr. Scott. <laughs> Mr. has some respect to it, but Scott has it familiar enough that it's not overly formal. So like they came over to watch football and they'd say, hey, Mr. Scott, can we do this? Whatever. It's just it was very polite, very cute. They come, hey, hey, Mr. Scott said we could do this if it was okay with you. What do you think? So fast forward, about two and a half years ago, Scott and Joy got married. 
And Monday, I was invited to the courthouse, to the Superior Court, because Scott was adopting these two little boys. And so I got to be a part of this and to witness this. And Judge Freeman came in, and we all stood. And, and then the attorney, Sharon, and the judge, Freeman said, this is, this is the favorite part of my job. So he's signing all of these documents, and then he gives the little boys these little adoption bears. And he says, I have one more thing for you. He says, when we make a decision in a court, we kind of seal it with the slamming of the gavel. So he gave them these little gavels. He says, now we're going to all do this together. Are you ready? And so they all come down together on this gavel that it's a done deal. At this point now, no longer do Wyatt and Wesley have to say, Mr. Scott. Now they can cry out, Abba, Father. They can call him Dad because there's something that has changed. Put a pin in that story for just a minute. We'll come back to it. So the Spirit is sent into our hearts to adopt us, to give us family status. You see that, that, that beautiful parallel that, that the Son is sent into the world to redeem us. The Spirit is sent into our hearts to give us this family status. The Son works for us. The Spirit works within us. One of them gives us a legal status. We're free. We're, we're called this. And one of them gives us this experience that we are children of the King. So Judge Freeman says... Um, Mr. Hume, I understand you would like to address the court. He said, I would. He stands up, and I won't go into all this again. Got permission for all this, by the way. He thanks his attorney. He thanks the court. He thanks his family and friends. He thanks and talks to his children. And then he turns to these little boys, and he, he says, this. I, he sent it to me because I asked for it. He said these things. He said, I love the parallels that our God allows us to see. His love through our lives. He uses the world's sins and brokenness to heal and restore. He clearly tells us we are adopted into his royal family by accepting him. And today, I get to reflect that grace by adopting you into our family. In Romans 8, 15, I love this. We're in the court of law and he's quoting scripture. In Romans 8, 15, it says, for you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear but you receive the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. And then Scott says to these two little boys, he is our heavenly father and I get to imperfectly be your earthly father. Uh -huh. See, the judge signed, brought the gavel down, gave them the legal status. But Scott comes and gives them the daily family experience status. You are full sons. What an incredible picture. You remember in the story of the prodigal son? The son has embarrassed the family. He's rebelled. He's squandered everything. And he finds himself in the pig pen realizing that the hired hands back at his dad's place are treated better than this. And he puts this plan together in Luke chapter 15. He says to himself, I will set out and go back today to my father. Still legally, he's my father. And say to him, Father... I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. Can we push pause there? You know what I think breaks the heart of God? Is when people who have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus accept their legal status, forgiven, set free, but continue to live like a hired man continuing to try to earn, continuing to try to somehow pay for, continuing to try, instead of being a son. Well, so he got up, he went to his father, and while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him, and he ran to his son, and he threw his arms around him, and he kissed him, kissed him in his filth, kissed him in his unworthiness, kissed him in his stench, kissed him in all of this. I think it was Lloyd 